Associate Director of Urban Design at Savills. Uh, David Rudlin, who is the director of Urbed and author of uh, the uh, National so, Model Code. He's being stupid, and they have the stupid idea of doing it on Zoom. So I'm doing Can it you on mute Zoom. yourself, please? And uh, and uh, Stefan Krutskowski, uh, um, who is the um, uh, an urban design uh, consultant, and Alan Wilde, who is the Housing Development and Enabling Manager for Oxford City Council. So the first person to come up is uh, Claire Mitchell. And, well, here we go. So Claire is an urban designer and landscape architect. She's worked on urban design and regeneration and the public realms projects throughout the UK, uh, Europe and uh, the States. Uh, she's written for professional and academic journals on the issues affecting uh, the built environment. She's, as we said, an associate director of urban design at Savills. And uh, she also has an experience of both public and private sectors being a design and conservation team leader at Charwell District Council uh, the, uh, and the enlarged Charwell and South Northants uh, Council uh, arrangement. Um, so uh, she's also actually involved in Bob MK. So I'm gonna hand you over to Claire who will talk about the um, uh, density and the 15 minute city. Great. Yeah. Fantastic. Give me a second while I share my screen. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction, John. Um, I'm really um, excited to be here talking to you today about the 15 minute city. Um, I've had a, a long um, interest in uh, sustainable urbanism and the uh, role uh, that density plays in that. Um, I, when I was first asked to give this talk, I was reflecting on my undergrad dissertation 21 years ago, reading um, the Urban Task Force um, document on the urban renaissance, PPG3, uh, um, and uh, Urbed's work, um, as well as sustainable neighborhoods. Um, so really excited to be talking to you today. And I've been following over the last couple of years, um, all the discussions there have been on the concept of the 15 minute city. Um, so I'm just gonna give you um, a bit of an overview. So the structure of the talk today um, is a relatively brief overview on five points. Um, the first being questioning what is the 15 minute city? Um, and taking a bit of an overview of uh, different schemes which are coming up in different parts of the world. Um, and then kind of reflecting back, uh, looking back into history to see is this really new and, um, and how does it reapply? Then looking specifically at the role of um, density and its relevance to delivering it. Um, and then a, a fast overview of how we make the 15 minute city uh, with some quick highlights. Um, and then a single slide on a, a bit of a summary of, of, of the benefits and, and how we approach it. So starting off, um, it's, it's very hard to give the definition of the 15 minute city. Um, in many ways, um, it's, it's something which potentially has been seen um, before in lots of urban design guidance. Um, and the approach tends to vary depending on the location, context and aspirations. But I think what is common in all the places, the three places that I'm going to highlight um, is a real focus on neighborhood, neighborhood looking at the capturing kind of a, the, the mood of uh, the moment in terms of climate change, um, our response to um, the global pandemic, when there's a really is a new focus on localism and a question in terms of well, where do we want to live and how do we want that place to look? Um, and also, I think a really key and probably most important theme which runs through all these places is empowered decision makers, um, people who are, make, who are willing to make really bold and decisive changes 
make things happen. So she put their, their neck on the line. Um, so one of the first um, places I'll just very quickly talk about is what's going on in Victoria, in, in Melbourne, Victoria, uh, where um, the concept of the 20-minute city um, has been um, put very forward very, very clearly in um, the planning policy through uh, Melbourne Direction 5. Um, that has some key themes in terms of uh, movement, employment, uh, education, health, open spaces, and the built environment. But the whole concept of this uh, and other places is that actually all the facilities, the amenities that you need to, to live your life, whether that's work, health, education, recreation, you should be able to do within 800 meters or a short walk of, of, your, um, <clears throat> of your home. Um, and 800 meters being quite key in terms of actually when you get much beyond that, people aren't willing to make that journey. People will resort to their cars. Um, perhaps the, the area which has been spoken uh, most about in recent years is what's going on in Paris, where again, you've had very strong political leadership from Anne Hidego um, and um, oh, I've forgotten. I haven't noted down, um, Professor Mon, I'll, I'll leave that for a moment, um, but a, a lot of political leadership um, in terms of embedding neighbourhood as a, a true focus. And a lot of this focuses on movement and changing the, the public, um, the kind of public space structure and um, street framework to ensure that actually movement is simple and easy and your neighborhood actually begins to function. So Paris is obviously a very dense city and a lot of these facilities are within easy access of most people. Um, but often it's the movement structures which um, are, are, are detrimental to people doing that. So uh, you're beginning in, in 2020, they introduced 650 kilometers, almost kind of over the course of a couple of months of new cycleways, um, acknowledging that 66% um, of the streets in Paris is given away to cars. And that's only actually accounting for 17% of the movement of the population. So it's therefore very inefficient. So the focus has been on building a city for people and not for cars and ensuring that people have access to, to can live, work, have all their supplies, um, caring facilities, learning facilities, and enjoyment and recreation within that same environment. A slightly different concept is evolving in, in Denmark, which is again, more locally focused. So rather than we we'll jump from the 20 minute to the 15 minute, now down to the one minute city in a, um, a concept called street moves, which is essentially about the place you live, the street you live, um, and ensuring that um, the neighborhood spaces are transformed to be people focused and friendly, encouraging um, sustainable movements, uh, active movement for walking and cycling, and dwell time on the street to transform the way that people view their neighborhoods. And, parklets are, are popping up all over the place, as you will see in lots of other cities, whether it's New York or, or London, the concept of these parklets is, is something which is being employed in lots of different places. Um, but I wanted to reflect a little bit in terms of is this new? Um, so this is a slide from probably a couple of years ago um, on placemaking and sustainable urbanism. And really, I think I could just cross the title out and put in the 15 minute city instead, because I think all the things that we as um, planners and urban designers in terms of creating uh, sustainable places, walkable neighborhoods, uh, robust urban form and, and, and well functioning mixed use places, it hasn't changed. The same things easily and very simply translate back to the 15 minute city. Um, but at its core, I think there's a, a number of principles that we can pull out. Um, the 15 minute city is, is fundamentally about livability. It's a people focused place. It's the most, one of the most important things in, in my opinion is the connectivity that you have between neighborhoods. Um, if you look at Oxford, 
Um, majority of Oxford is served very well um, by local centres, um, ample shops and facilities, live workplaces, etc. Um, but actually the connectivity to these places can be poor. So a real focus on the connectivity, how you get to these places, promoting active movement and a really positive public realm. So you want to walk, you want to cycle because you feel safe and actually happy doing so. Um, providing residents um, with all the um, normal kind of um, facilities and amenities they need to get good services, fresh food, healthcare, um, ensuring that neighbourhoods um, accommodate a wide range of households, different sizes, housing types, levels of affordability, um, and that people have access to green spaces um, and, and healthy, clean air. Um, and in, in addition, kind of the employment is something which is an integral part of the neighbourhood, uh, whether that's working remotely, as I think we all are today, um, or in co-working space, small offices, and the retail and hospitality, which can support that. <coughs> um, and there's a huge number of benefits which come from this. So there's benefits in terms of personal well-being, uh, communities and the social value that brings, creating more of a, a local economy um, with more of the, the spend and free spend staying in that neighbourhood, that community, that city. Uh, producing high quality of public realm, uh, reduced uh, air pollution and significant benefits in terms of climate change, um, whether that's through reduction of commuting, denser housing, um, access, better access to parks and uh, green spaces and the kind of uh, the, the cleansing uh, sense that trees give you in those contexts. Um, but I said I would just reflect Backly, back quickly, just having a quick tranche through the, the last hundred or so years of history. I'm going to start with Oxford in 1900, um, which I think is very clearly a 15 minute city. You have a clear hierarchy between the town centre and very defined neighbourhoods, um, and clear sets of um, neighbourhood centres, um, or let's call it high streets. Uh, which sit within them. You have the arterial roads in Oxford, whether that's Cowley Road, um, uh, Banbury Road, um, St Clements, etc., which are providing these diverse and mixed-use spaces. Um, and in 1900, I think I'm sat in one, one of these houses, um, the Oxford is defined by mid-density housing, divide, defining pretty much the whole of the city also had a very rudimentary tram system, uh, which pulled you to, through the arterial routes and through the Victorian city, albeit by um, horse-drawn as the, uh, the academics refused to allow um, electrification of the lines. What happened? Uh, well, we got the car, gave us freedom to travel and everyone wanted one. It was alluring. Um, I, 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 I really do prefer my bike, but um, some of these cars really were beautiful. Um, and overnight, there were dramatic changes to our cars and cities. Um, so this is, um, bottom line is um, uh, High Street in Oxford. Uh, top line is uh, Turner's classic view of the High Street. Streets were immediately taken over by cars. Uh, but more than that, we began to have dispersed patterns of movement and began shaping our environments in a very car-dominated way. Um, we had supermarkets, low-density suburbs, the high street declined, we walked less, we cycled less, there was an immediate impact on kind of the health and well-being, as well as impact on the local economy. And the type of urban environments that we started to create um, from the uh, Tesco Extra on Cowley Ring Road to Templar Square, um, to the view at Kazan and Milton Park created very different and very defined uh, patterns of movement, all driven by the car. Um, but if we step forward a little bit, um, this wasn't the beginning of debate, there's been debates um, the whole way through, um, but in the uh, end of the 20th century, um, that debate to, began to grasp political momentum. Um, 
first, uh, well, lo lots of different people, some of you on the, uh, the talking today, um, but we had um, Urbed um, and their publication of Building 21st Century Home. We had the Urban Task Force championed by Richard Rogers, uh, creating a, a vision towards an urban renaissance. We had the adoption of PPG3 in 2000, all of this setting out a, a clear vision for sustainable regeneration, a focus on compact multi-centre towns and cities, a focus on mixed use, live work, well-designed and connected environments, higher densities and reusing brownfield sites. All very sensible things and I think um, the diagram which is now 22 possibly more years old from um, the Urban Task Force is as relevant today to the 15 minute city um, as, as many of the other plans that we've seen. Um, but I wanted to touch upon as well why, why density is relevant in the 15 minute city. Um, so all facilities and amenities have um, a catchment area um, and a quantum of people which need to um, uh, needed to service that. And it's a very simple mathematical equation in many ways. Um, this is completely abstracted, but it, in very simple terms, the lower the population, the wider the catchment area needs to be to um, support those facilities and amenities. The wider you are from those facilities and amenities, the further, less likely you are to walk, to cycle, um, and the more likely you are to drive. And as soon as you're driving, well, you might not go to the facilities in your, in your local community, you might go to the Ring Road or to other places or to Digcot or wherever else is most appropriate. Um, so that's a very simple overview. Um, but density, I think as we all know, is a, is a very clumsy measure. It's, it's only part of the answer. Um, density doesn't talk about typologies. And one of the um, impacts of um, PPG3 was um, house builders were immediately forced to take their developments and build to higher densities. Um, so the little diagram on the upper right hand side just um, shows the densities that people were building in in 2000 and just five years later the a significant, absolutely massive increase in density that we had at that point. But a lot of this wasn't actually, some of this, there were a lot of very good schemes which came out of this move. But there actually also a lot of poor schemes and we had a lot of monocultural housing, just yeah, housing estates on the edge of towns, which didn't deliver mixed use, which didn't deliver a 15 minute city at all, or any of the aspirations actually set out in the Urban Task Force and others, um, but delivered monocultural um, housing estates, which were really pretty uninspiring um, and, and just pushed the density up rather than created any of the wider benefits that we were all looking for. So in terms of what's, what is relevant for, for the discussion, what is relevant in terms of density? Um, the Victorian terraces that we were talking about um, in terms of um, Oxford in, um, in, in the 19, late, late 19th century is a really good solid um, template uh, which works well. All of these neighbourhoods, um, I can see directly from where I live now, how with some good tinkering by Oxford City Council could really shine. It could be reinvented very quickly and very nicely. Um, garden cities, um, low density, but again, the kind of the focus on um, green spaces and active movement can translate very well. Same with urban villages and influence of historic towns. But what doesn't work is the very low density suburbs, um, which I don't think we're building quite like this anymore, but there's still some pretty poor places which are popping up on the edges of our towns and cities are going to be very, very difficult to serve as 15-minute um, cities as they stand at the moment. So probably running low on time, so I'm going to give you a whistle-stop tour on some ideas in terms of making a 15-minute city. Um, we've got a bit of an opportunity at the moment. Um, we are all um, doing some navel-gazing and thinking about the kinds of places that we want to live in. We have had um, a significant lifestyle shift 
um, over the last year. But that is only really um, building on, on changes which were already happening anyway. Um, changes in demographics are it kind of accelerating. We, um, for the moment, we're making less use of public transport. Um, offices and workplaces potentially will need um, less space for fewer people. Um, and balanced with this, people are going to are commuting less distance, um, which is just as well because our transport system, our infrastructure was never going to cope um, with the levels, accelerating levels of commuting which were occurring. So the first thing is um, a lot of our towns and cities already have a, a fabulous structure which we can, can key into. So this is my local high street, um, Cali Road. It's probably uh, about an eight minute walk, a uh, four minute cycle. Um, and it provides um, a really diverse range of, of workspaces, of restaurants, of grocery stores, of delicatessens, um, of charities. Um, it doesn't function brilliantly in some ways. Um, the, the quality of the environment definitely could do with improvement. Um, and um, the accessibility for uh, walking and cycling is okay, but it could certainly shine a lot better. Um, but this, these kind of places punctuate most of our towns and cities. They can be found up and down most places in the UK. And if you look at the structure of Oxford um, and draw 15 minute rings around it, you will find that most areas, almost all areas within the ring road are well served. It's when you get outside the ring road that things begin to filter a lot. But I think the first thing is focusing on the existing structure that we, we have at the moment. That's a really easy win in terms of getting places functioning and principles of 15 minute city. Streets and spaces are an abs absolutely critical part, both in terms of um, active movements and providing that priority over um, cars, so giving up space for cars uh, and creating green space, uh, and potentially repurposing parking areas with pocket spaces. Um, and there's a lot of schemes which are going on in London um, in terms of how you connect the um, existing bike lanes and kind of expand that network to encourage these, this, these movements. Um, one of the things which really has changed is, is data. Um, so space syntax have obviously been around for um, a good 20 or so years, um, but the use of their kind of work and other work gives us real time um, and very detailed information, which we can use to support informed decision-making and support leadership. And this might be on movement, it might be on economic issues or social issues. Thinking about um, how we build places with um, flexible um, uses, the opportunities to create more local facilities to encourage flexible use of buildings and public space, uh, promoting co-working space to create those um, diverse spaces which need to be at the heart and the centre of a 15 minute city. Uh, can um, you just move, move along please? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, a variety of Variety of densities promoting um, a gentle urbanism. We're not talking about high rise, but three, three or more stories um, provides density, which is really positive. Um, and finally, kind of with new developments, um, making sure that you connect well to existing neighbourhoods, um, but making a long term investment in vibrant neighbourhood centres. So seeing this as something which is um, a long-term project that is not about the short-term values, but the long-term values and integrating offices and workplaces. And the final slide, John, um, there's an opportunity here for high streets to be reinvigorated, for um, active movement to be promoted, to reduce commuting, to support better environment with air quality and safer, healthier places with better physical and mental health for all. But what do we need? We need um, momentum. We really do need to seize the moment here, and that takes political leadership. Um, all of the places which um, have uh, clearly been promoting the 20, 15, and two minutes, one minute city have been have done so through very clear leadership. We need a long term approach to investment, especially with new developments, 
um, good community facilities um, aren't always paid for, um, are, are hard to, to, to finance. Um, streets for people, creating the right mix of uses, using gentle density, and actually to be bold, try things out, sometimes it won't work, um, but using local power to engage and um, create new things. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you very much, Claire. Uh, we'll just wait for the screen to change, but what I'd like to do is to ask a question. We've got a series of poll questions, which I think will be very useful. So the first one uh, is about um, uh, the 15 minute city and, uh, uh, oh, well, we've got three, okay. Right, um, ha so have you, have your local authorities or any that you are aware of applied to be pilot authority for the National Design Code? Question. Um, do you think the principles of the 15 minute city could apply to your neighborhood? Question. And three, um, have you adopted or are considering uh, adopting, where is it? The Healthy Life, Building for Healthy Life, uh, stroke building for life 12. So this will be very interesting and we'll take it away and have a look at it. And that might form the basis of uh, some of the discussion afterwards. So we'll end po polling very shortly. So do put your name in there. Okay, and we've got 85 people so we can work out actually percentages and the number of people. That's great. Okay. I'll give you another 10 seconds, six seconds. Okay, thank you. Um, our second speaker is David Rudlin. David is a principal and director of Urbed, which is the Urbanism, Environment and Design. He's chair of the Academy of Urbanism and honorary professor at Manchester University. Uh, Urbed have been responsible for the National Model Design Codes, which he'll talk about. And um, uh, David was also a winner of the Wolfson Economics Prize. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be part of that winning team. So um, I'm sure we all learned a lot at that time. Uh, he's planner by training, started his career with Manchester City Council. And then uh, he's also the secretary for Homes for Change, a housing cooperative responsible for commissioning one of the flagship buildings of the Hume redevelopment. Uh, so David, um, would you like to start your presentation. <laughs> um, yeah, we've worked together for many years, haven't we? Um, we have indeed. <laughs> good to see you again. Um, I'm here going to talk a little bit today about the National um, uh, Model Design Code. <clears throat> um, and I think Andy Van Bradsky is going to um, be talking at a future event. Um, so I've taken out Andy's slides. I've been doing this quite a lot as a joint presentation with Andy, but I've taken out Andy's slide and put a few of my own in just to, just to, to, to liven up a bit. Um, I would say, I want to start by saying, I think we should have done a poll saying, did anyone on the call disagree with anything that Claire just said? Um, I bet if we asked that question, the answer would have been 100%, nobody would disagree with that. Um, and so the question I have is, why aren't we doing it? Because if the people on this call, um, the people in local authorities responsible for this stuff aren't doing it, then who is? I mean. It, who is going to be responsible for creating good urban places if not us? There is no one else. We're, we're, we're the ones. And actually what I've become increasingly interested in over the years is not what good looks like. Um, there does no harm, obviously, to restate what good looks like. But how do we create it? How do we create good? Um, because that's what we're um, lamentably bad at doing. Um, we've forever, you know, we've agreed the principles of good urban design for 20, 30 years now, but we still produce um, 
pretty poor fare. And that's actually also teams made up of people entirely bought into the thing. You know, we do master planning work. And I go and see some of the stuff that gets built. I'm thinking it isn't quite what we had in mind. So the, the process is really interesting. I, I wanted just to put this in. This is um, the Heme Guide to Development that um, I, I wrote with a friend um, back in 1994, I think it was. Um, and this was at a time when the we people really didn't agree on the principles. Um, when we were doing the Hume Guides development, which is, includes all the things that you would expect to find in a design code today, um, there were huge arguments. C crossroads were seen as, as something which was um, uh, a, a completely irresponsible thing to put into an urban layout because um, that's where accidents took place. Um, the idea of buildings addressing streets and so on, and part, you know, it just just wasn't an easy argument to have. So we've moved on a huge amount from that. We are now at a point, um, and, and Claire helpfully sort of laid out the sort of journey that we went through to get to the point where we do now agree with this stuff. The question is, how do we go about doing it? So the question, um, the, the Hume thing was a, was called a guide, um, and, and guides basically tell you um, all the things that you should be trying to achieve with development. And so the question is, what's the difference between a guide and a code? Um, this is an example of an urbed code for a scheme called Chapel Garth up in Sunderland. Um, and I'd say the key thing about a code is it relates to a map. Um, so a code is physically rooted in some way. So you say, you say, for example, that streets should be so wide and, and, and buildings should be so high, but you then show a map showing where those streets are. And so you're actually linking um, a, a set of um, principles back into um, a, 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 a physical manifestation on a plan. The other thing that a code does, which guides don't do so much, is they are definite. Um, they have yes, no answers where possible. They have numeric answers. They, they say um, density shall be over a certain level and you can measure definitely in it whether that is being um, uh, implemented. Whereas, you know, uh, a, a, a statement like, you know, should sh achieve gentle density, that doesn't actually mean a great deal. Codes have specifics in it. So the idea of the National Urban Design Code um, was to, um, take the principles of a code that you would apply to a site like the Chapel Garth one in Sunderland and apply it to policy guidance. Now, clearly there are problems doing that because um, this applies to the entire country. We don't have a, a plan or a mask plan to do it, um, do it on. And so the whole point of the National Urban Design Code was to think about a process by which we might do that. So I'm not gonna to talk today about any of the content of the code. I'm not going to talk about streets and, and, and urban form and, and policy design because that's all in the guidance notes and I'm sure you're able to read that. What I'm going to focus on is the process. So I think the process is what's important. So um, this is a collaborative effort. Um, I, I was one of the authors but Andy Bombradsky also wrote sections of it um, and we've had input from a huge number of other government departments um, in terms of its development. I keep failing to move this on. Um, and the idea of the code is that it has this scales of development. So it can apply to a whole local authority. Um, it can apply to an area type. And I'll come back to what an area type is in a second. Um, it can apply to specific development sites. And it all has to apply to plots. So when you're developing a single building, the code has to give you a framework of policies which tell you what you can do on that plot. That, that is, is crucial. Um, the coding process is based upon seven steps. Um, we were told by MHC or G that that was too complicated. So we had to make them into three steps. And so you've got these three steps and we put the sub steps in to get the seven back. Um, but it's a fairly straightforward step-by-step um, -step process that you would go through in terms of creating this code. Step one is analysis, um, as you'd expect. So, um, and, and the anticipation is that local authorities will use their existing JS systems to um, create a series of um, analysis plans of, of, of the neighborhood. Step two, or, or 1A, sorry, um, is um, then to take a few decisions about what the code is gonna do. So the first decision is what area does it cover? As I say, it doesn't need to cover the whole district. 
um, it can cover just development sites if you want. So on this site, the red sites, I, 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 I defy you to identify this town, it's been um, disguised. But you have development sites, so it may just relate to development sites, it may relate to some existing urban areas where change is expected, or it may relate to the entire local authority area. So that's a, the first question is coverage. The second question is the subject matter. Um, so it almost certainly will include movement, nature, built form, identities, public space and use. Um, it may not include things like um, internal space standards, um, uh, things about sustainability and so on. Not saying that those things aren't important, but you may wish to cover them elsewhere in your policy agenda in the council rather than being in a code. Uh, we had a lot of discussion uh, about whether those should be in the codes at all. Um, and we felt very strongly that they should be in there, um, but it, the code may not be the best place for different local authorities to include that stuff. Um, then we have the, 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 um, the baseline work, sort of mapping these issues and certain plans that you'll require in terms of developing the code, like the street hierarchy of the neighbourhood and so on. But this goes into stage two, um, which is the, the vision. Now, the um, key idea within this, um, if it, a code for a specific site um, will often be split into character areas and a street hierarchy. And if you know which character area you're in and which street you're on, then you, you can de de derive a set of um, rules to apply to each plot. So um, we weren't able to use the word character area. Um, various other government departments had claimed that already. So we use the term area type. Um, an area type is essentially the same as a character area. Um, it's an area of um, the, um, the settlement which has a relatively consistent character. And so the idea is to identify those on a plan. And actually the previous plan I showed here shows those, um, the area types. Um, in terms of the numbers you have, um, they may be, they may just be one if you've got a very consistent area that you're doing the code for, there may only be a single area type, there may be multiple ones. Um, and the idea is then to you to identify a char the characteristics of that um, area type. Um, so this is a coding plan which shows um, up to 10 area types. We've, I mean, we, we include these 10 as suggested possible area type, not as a sort of a prescriptive uh, um, examples of the sort of area types that you may have. So you've got, you know, high rise cities, you've got um, uh, urban neighborhoods, suburbs and so on, each with a different different character. And the map shows how you would then um, map them onto a plan um, with the dotted lines there being the allocations. Uh, some people have said the code doesn't tell them, um, doesn't say anything about the location of developments. And the reason for that is that that's not its job. The, the actual allocation of sites comes from the local plan the code kept steps in once those allocations have been made. So we're not talking about location of development, we're talking about the design of it once it's been allocated. Now the key thing about the area types is that um, the guidance for them should re re refer to what you wish them to be rather than what they are now. So for example, a suburban area where your local plan policy is to look for intensification, the code reflects that intensification and is not, um, is not based upon necessarily the character as it is now. Um, some of which you may want to change, of course. Um, on the development sites, in order to apply the code, you need a plan. Um, for existing urban areas, the plan exists in the built layout of the, the, the area, but for uh, a new site, you need a plan. Um, there may well all already be a plan which the landowner or the developer has produced, um, but if not, or in conjunction with them, um, the code will require a, a broad master plan for each of the development sites setting out the street hierarchy, um, setting out also the area types and the open space structure, so that you therefore know that you have the street hierarchy, you have the area types, and therefore the rules can be derived for each part of the, the plan. Um, we then go on to step three, um, which is the code itself. Um, this is in two parts. Um, the first part is the rules which apply to each area type. So in the, um, in the draft code, we, um, use three example area types. Again, these are just purely um, illustrative in terms of what they might be. Um, you may have more or, or less, but we use town centers, urban neighborhoods and, and suburbs as the area types to show how they would work. And then for each of the um, 
headings and the headings in the code are the same as the ones in the national um, design guide which Tibbles produced last year um, so we, we, we keep the same structure and you may have noticed actually the design guide has been updated in conjunction with the draft codes the two now now knit together um, so on each of the um, 10 areas we have a, a brief description of, of, of the issue we have a set of suggested policies um, the sort of things that you might include in the local code we show how they policies would um, vary by area type by our town center urban neighborhood and suburb and then we have a summary summary diagram which shows what me that means when you start to put those things together and we do that for each of the um, the subject matter the, the the 10 areas in the code where these things vary by area type um, which is not all of them of course um, we also included a, a section and, and, and uh, lots of people, including the ROBA, were looking very closely at the draft code to look for evidence of um, a bias towards traditional design. Uh, we are very, very careful not to put that into the code. Um, we say that regardless of aesthetics, um, the design of buildings should be covered by codes um, and that that should be based upon the principles of good building, uh, which could apply to both contemporary and traditional architecture um, so it is stylistically neutral um, in terms of, of design the code but it does give um, guidance on uh, the fact that buildings should face the street and should have a bases and middles and tops and and, and varied roof lines and all that type of thing um, which um, can be done in, in a variety of ways in terms of how they're they're done um, the um, code we had a long debate actually um, about whether we could put any actual parameters in the code because of course we're dealing with the whole country it's in, almost impossible to be specific but we put these in as examples so you know we so sort of as I said at the beginning specific things that one might include in a code which are measurable so an urban neighborhood densities between 60 to 120 dwellings per hectare a floor area ratio of one party walls on both sides of the building so you have terraced forms uh, perimeter blocks building lines covering 75 percent of the the building lines yeah these are quite specific things that you can measure and the hope is that local codes will have this type of specific coding in it so that actual well first of all developers know exactly what's required of them and secondly development managers can actually um, uh, quite clearly give a yes no answer about whether the code is being is being followed um, we also um, we're doing this obviously in tandem with manual for streets um, manual for streets is currently being updated um, consultants are working on that with a view to I think it being the draft being published in about six months time so this timing wasn't brilliant because we were slightly out of sync so we included in the code lots of street sections of which these are just two examples um, on the basis that we're interested here in the proportion and size of the street the the, the, the ratio of, of height to, to width and the broad arrangements of uses within the space leaving the highway engineering of that to, to manual for streets. And so there is a real crossover, I think, between what is in the model code and what's in manual for streets. Um, we then develop this into two matrices, which I think will be key to each code. Um, the first matrix is the, um, the, the street hierarchy. Um, and this shows um, the primary high street, secondary streets and tertiary streets, and, and you may have other types of street in your hierarchy. And it then shows the area types across the top. And so a high street in a town center will be very different to a high street in a suburb. And we set ratios and so on for each of those. Um, the second matrix, which isn't filled in because it would um, be impossible um, to do for all the policies, is to have the area types across the top and the policies down the side and so you would be able to say my scheme is in uh, is in this area type and therefore I can read down and for each policy I can see what the setting is for my, my area um, so it becomes very specific sorry I can't say specific suddenly um, so and then finally there's um, a section of the code which is non area type specific um, there's quite lots of stuff in, in, in the code, which actually doesn't vary very much by area type. The idea that you should have a definition between public and private space and buildings should face onto public space and back onto private space, that's a universal. It's not something which varies very much by area type. A lot of the technical guidance in terms of um, sustainability and so on clearly applies across area types. And so 
The final bit of the code is, is things which we would expect the code to include um, covering all area types. And this, this is an example um, from the nature section, um, again, looking at the, um, the, the general statements, the suggested um, policies um, and the overall diagram. Um, I should say that throughout of each of these, we, we, we wrote the guidance notes first and then realized that they got too long. And so this, um, each of these um, sections has references in it to the guidance notes, which means that you allow, you can then click through hopefully and, and, and link to, to more, more detailed guidance. Um, and just to the guidance notes, they, they, they cover, as I say, the 10, um, 10 areas in the national um, design guide. And they look very much like this. Um, the, the brief was to make them as illustrated as possible. Um, as as few words as possible. The first draft I wrote actually had twice as many words as the final version, um, and I, I went through a painful process of trying to decide what I could lose. But um, they were essentially done through a, a whole series of uh, about a hundred or so drawings that we did for, for especially for the code, and these are just example pages of, of those things. Um, so just to draw it to a close, um, as I think. Um, some of you indicated the the deadline for the pilot stage of the coding um, uh, closed this week. Um, I don't, I haven't been made party to how many applications have been made for those pilot stages, but I know it's been very well, well very well supported. Quite a few authorities have. Um, Ten will be selected, um, and they'll be selected to give a got a, a range of areas from urban places to rural places so we can test out the, the code in, in practice. Um, the consultation process of course is still open um, until March, in, um, I can't remember the date in March but sometime mid-March on the code so again please um, submit on the MHC or G website comments on the code and hopefully um, we'll find out from the poll how many people have, um, have uh, applied to be pilots. Um, of course, once all this finishes, um, the hope is that I, the hope, I think the expectation is that every local authority will develop a code of some kind for its area. Again, there's a debate about the extent to that will be a, rec a requirement or a recommendation. Um, but again, that's um, that, that's from HCLG. So thank you for that. I'm going to stop there um, and pass back to John. Okay, um, thank you very much, David. That was very helpful. Um, and I'm uh, looking forward to the questions that'll uh, start coming through. Um, and uh, what I'd like to do now is ask uh, Stefan uh, uh, Krutskowski uh, to please uh, uh, talk about Building for a Healthy Life now. Stefan is an urban designer. He's co-author of the Building for Life 12, and he's been a member of the Urban Design Group since 1998. Um, he is co-author of this Building for a Healthy Life, which is a significant contribution to thinking about how we design places and spaces. Um, both he and David um, are contributors, actually, to a forthcoming Urban Design Group journal on how we should design our post-corona neighborhoods. Um, because there is some, um, there are all sorts of issues about um, constraints, um, why things are coming out the, the way that they do in spite of everything and all the work that officers do. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing um, what Stefan have, has to say, and we'll then get on to the Q&A um, after uh, Alan. Um, which is who's talking next. Stefan, you okay? Yeah, thank you. Uh, hopefully you can all see my screen. Yeah, I'm assuming everybody can. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Right. I forgot to mention that you actually run your own practice and, and work, at, uh, work with um, Buckinghamshire Council. Yes, yes. Thank, uh, thanks, thanks for the introduction, John, and, and hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for asking me to talk about um, BHL this afternoon. Um, I, I'm an urban designer. My background is in local government, and um, I, I've got a practice. Essentially, it's me and the dog who's sat down there in his basket running from my back bedroom um, and increasingly the kitchen table for a change of scene. Um, 
80% of my work is in uh, local government still. So um, I provide support in primarily DM. So um, I support eight councils up and down the country, um, dropping in, helping them out on applications, sometimes helping them out on uh, emerging policies. Um, and, and, and I think that's quite an interesting point because a lot of authorities up and down the country don't have much in the way of design expertise and they don't have the resources to appoint their own urban designers. So um, from a business point of view, it's, it's where I found a gap in the market, which is essentially providing day support to local authorities. So the purpose of today's session is to give you an overview of Building for a Healthy Life. We have got a small print run here. Um, all the local authorities in the country will be receiving a copy. Um, a copy is being sent to the leader of every council and chief executives. If your council hasn't received a copy, I don't know if anybody's going in to check the post. Um, uh, if you haven't received yours, drop me an email. My email's on the slide and, and we'll, we'll chase up the copy for you. Um, you can see that Building for Healthy Life is endorsed by a number of organisations. Um, and uh, there's been some interesting changes in the last year, which um, led to Building for Life 12 being re-edited and relaunched as building for a healthy life. So I think it's fair to say the policy landscape is changing. We're most probably seeing a design renaissance that we've not actually seen since the days of CAVE. And as an urban designer, um, I, I think that's really exciting, really refreshing to see. And, and it's really about time, you know, that we, we see government getting increasingly involved and concerned about the quality of the built environment. So we're seeing a raft of documents appearing, a lot of interest, um, and a, a lot of high level political support and, and interest in this. Um, policy is one thing, but we know resources and the remits of people in the planning system and also highways authorities is another. We know local authorities are increasingly stretched. Uh, we're being asked to do uh, more with less. Um, we know local authorities are under, well, have been under significant funding pressure since their last credit crisis and we had budget cuts etc um, and I, I think it's not beyond imagination to think that's most probably uh, not too far on the horizon again so I think we can see resources in local authority being reduced over the future years um, but we've also got an issue in terms of remits you know there's a lot of finger pointing that is directed to highways authorities but I think essentially we, we get what we pay for with highways authorities. We ask them to um, adopt and maintain highways. Um, all these documents talk about streets. Um, we, we need streets authorities and we need to change the agreement of streets authorities and they need to be appropriately funded to do this. Um, we've obviously got Active Travel England that's going to come into force with quite a considerable budget. Um, whether or not that helps in solving these underlying issues, I think only time will tell. But we're getting a great design toolkit appearing. We've got Building for a Healthy Life, which I'm obviously talking about. Um, Homes England are, are shortly to publish Streets for a Healthy Life, which is a companion guide to consideration nine in Building for a Healthy Life. Uh, we've obviously heard from David about the National Model Design Code, and we've got uh, the, the work progressing on Manual for Streets. So there's a lot out there. In terms of a bit of a background about Building for a Healthy Life, it's been around um, in its former guise since 2012, and you can see some of the early reiterations there. The 12-point version was actually published in Welsh. So if you're a Welsh speaker, it's out there in, in Welsh for you. And when our colleagues at the Design Commission for Wales are returned to work after being furloughed, uh, Building for a Healthy Life will be published in Welsh as well. Uh, the story really started in 2019 with Building for a Healthy Life, where we had got um, Building for Life 12 up and around, used by uh, a lot of local authorities, appearing in a lot of neighbourhood plans. Um, and we had a phone call from the NHS saying that they wanted to embed their findings from the Healthy New Towns programme. Long story short, they commissioned us to update Building for Life, um, and they were very keen that the word health or healthy featured in the title, which is where we got the title change. Um, if you've had time to look at the draft consultation on the MPPF, you can see that uh, that change has also been recognized by government, which now cites uh, BHL rather than Building for Life 12. 
I think it's fair to say that we, we have an imperfect planning system. You know, um, I've been interested to hear the speakers um, and, you know, the, the qualities we value in the urban environment. But a lot of the problems are sort of, um, you know, very deep in the way we, we plan in this country. We, we have quite a, a quite an unusual planning system in that we're quasi sort of post-war American planning and this urbanist model. And we're, and we're sort of torn between the two. Um, and I think that's that's particularly sort of um, comes to the fore when you look at the types of development that are appearing in um, sort of di district and sort of county locations, so locations outside the more sort of established urban areas. So, you know, a lot of development happens on, on greenfield lands. We've got limited or non-existent public transport infrastructure. We're reliant on volume house builders with these models and, and um, systems that are well established, most probably started to really take root in the um, the early 80s, late 70s. Um, they use language such as square footage to acre, part, you know, in direct contrast to what the model design code talks about with, with its reference to the FAR measure. We, we've got local authorities who are massively under-resourced, stretched, um, and all too often we know we are reactive. We're, we're literally chasing our tails on planning applications. So, um, you know, a, a lot of the work around preparing design codes, I, I sort of question how that can actually be delivered in practice when we, we are very much reactive rather than proactive. Obviously, we, we would love to be more proactive. So we're really starting many developments with a series of imperfect pieces. So Building for Life really sort of says, well, how, how can we make um, a, a tool that works with an imperfect planning system? How can we make outcomes better? How can we help your, your typical planning officer who may not have design expertise they can draw on? How can we enable them to improve the quality of, of what and, they, and their planning committees approve? So a little snippet from the MPPF there we've seen. Um, and if you're not familiar with them, these are the 12 considerations. I haven't got time to go through them, but if you are familiar with Building for Life 12, you'll actually be familiar with the the, the, the three chapter structure and the general thrust of the considerations. Um, what has really changed is we put a stronger emphasis on active travel, um, healthier lifestyles. But as we were writing this new edition, um, we've got colleagues like Phil Jones on the editorial team and the authorship team. We, we were, were aware of LTN 120. Um, so, so we were building all these emerging policy and best practice interventions into the, the new edition. Um, we very much stress it's not a tick box exercise. This is not a case of saying, you know, Stefan, how, how many points does a scheme need to um, be uh, consistent with building for a healthy life? Essentially, we say that, you know, the, the, the guide gives you um, the, all, all the instructions and advice as to what green looks like on a development and equally what red looks like. So if you use that and you sort of assign a, a, a traffic light to each of the 12 considerations, um, once you get to the end of the process, if you've got one or more reds, you know you've got a fundamental problem with a design of a scheme. If the more greens, the better a development's going to be. So we say, you know, green, green is go ahead. Red is, you know, you know, take stock, think about what you're doing. And amber, if you get any amber, some of them might be justified. But in some cases, with a bit of work, you can turn those to greens as well. So that sort of colour um, sort of method of uh, communicating the qualities and, and deficiencies of a development, uh, particularly useful to planning committees as well, because they, they can understand this easily. So as you flip through the development, you'll uh, through, through the document, sorry, you'll see that there's a double page spread accompanying each of the considerations. So I'm just going to show you a couple. So um, we've got um, a, a spread here, uh, and basically it shows you what green looks like against that particular consideration. You can see some examples there, they're all over the country. They're from developers of different scales, volume house builders, local developers, mid-market, low value, high market areas. So a whole mix. And this is the interesting thing with the, the uh, BFL tool is that it is tried and tested across a range of market value areas um, and a range of uh, tenures. So we know it works on mixed tenure schemes. Uh, we also know 
uh, it works on single tenure schemes, such as just purely affordable housing schemes, where the, the, you know, the cost constraints are potentially the tightest. Um, and then we show spreads where we show what red looks like. So we're not only giving you sort of written guidance, so things to look out for, key prompts, key things to think about, but we're actually showing you what um, uh, red looks like in those particular scenarios. So there's a wonderful set of offerings from a variety of developers, again, all over the country. So, so it's a really accessible document. Uh, the first consideration is natural connections. Um, and basically we're, we're promoting connected streets and movement networks. All too often we see disconnected networks. Um, and, and this is frequently happening, particularly now that highway authorities are seeking to reduce adoptable extents. A disconnected street network is more attracted to a highways authority that is cash strapped than a connected street pattern. There's less for them to adopt. Um, and the same goes for things like street trees, etc. So um, one of the best things we can do is to create connected streets and movement networks and allow people to move around places easily. We've got to invite people to walk and cycle, particularly for those short distance journeys. The vast majority of journeys in this country are dominated by people using their cars for short trips that really we should be doing uh, by foot and by bike, particularly if we're going to solve some of the issues in this country around air quality, obesity, road congestion. The more people we can get onto uh, uh, their feet and onto cycles for short trips, the more we can really release road space for those people who are doing journeys that can't be done by those modes. Um, I'm going to have to whistle stop through these looking at my egg timer, um, but manual for streets gear change LTN 20 looks, looks like this. This is Trumpington Meadows in Cambridge. You know, some of the infrastructure that we're seeing happening up and down the country, where we see protected cycleways, more innovative approaches to how we get kids to school, particularly where parents maybe have to jump in a car at the start of the day and take, um, get onto the motorway to go to work. But all too often, this is what we're seeing. So we're seeing the exact opposite of what Manual for Streets promotes. Um, we're seeing this sort of cycle provision still being built up and down the country. You know, the world of, um, wonderfully disappearing uh, cycleways, but, but this is very common outside main, main urban areas. And my slides have stopped working, ah, here we are. So what, what we try and do with Building for Life is, is, is try and help you guard against the common pitfalls. So, you know, this is a really sensitive approach to how you might approach sustainable urban drainage. So you can see here, you know, this child is just ready to throw himself and drown himself into that that pond, but we, we've got a really attractive piece of um, attenuation here um, and it's ticking lots of other boxes in terms of biodiversity, net gain, etc. you know, an accessible piece of um, op open space. But all too often, this is, this is what we see. Now, you know, if you're a frog, that is a really sad place to live, isn't it? I mean, it's a really dispiriting environment. It's dispiriting for a frog and it's equally dispiriting for the people that live there. And, and these sort of meteor strikes holes in the ground are being counted as public open space, even though they're not attractive or functional pieces of open space. So um, SUDS is a, is a major challenge on new developments and Building for Life gives you some hints and tips on how to avoid common pitfalls. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but if you're familiar with Building for Life 12 and want to know the difference between this and Building for a Healthy Life, go to page 86 of the document. There's a link at the end of the presentation uh, where you can download a copy. Um, you might be puzzled how uh, Building for Life fits into things like the National Model Design Code. Well, paragraph 16 says that local authorities will be expected to use the code in the absence of local design guides. Lots of local authorities up and down the country are actually using Building for Life as, as their, de um, their, their design guidance. We're seeing it side to the neighbourhood plans and we're aware of a number of council consortiums who are using building for a healthy life and adapting it to local conditions so they're tailoring the bits around character etc. So to summarise um, there's a few um, interesting footnotes in the end of building for life which show you um, the thinking behind it and the sort of the you're standing on the shoulders of well-respected urban design giants so to speak in, in a lot of the content 
There's a table within it that's going to be updated shortly once the new MPA, MPPF is in place, but you can see the cross references between national tools and policy and the 12 considerations. So by way of a summary, um, Building for Healthy Life works best as a golden strand if you have it in local policy, if you're using it in pre-apps, um, if you're then using it um, in decision making, your planning committee are using it, you're using it then to you know, critique the quality of completed developments. It, it has the best effect rather than just using it um, when a consultation comes in. Say you, you get an application and you pass it on to somebody to critique against the considerations. You can use it from tomorrow. It's a piece of freeware. Um, it, it's there, download it tonight. You could use it on your cases from tomorrow. Homes England use it, it's their preferred tool. And the 12 considerations are, are very easy to understand. So we need to use tools like this with local communities and elected members who don't necessarily have design or planning skills or expertise. So it's, it's very accessible. It's also been written to help you with your heavy caseloads. Um, so I hope this overview has been useful. Um, uh, I'm happy for these shares, uh, the, these shares, these slides to be shared um, with, with, with everybody here. Um, because there's some useful links there. So if you want to find out more about gear change, building for health life, there's a good hour's worth of, maybe two hours worth of YouTube videos. Um, and there's also the link to the document. There's also my email. If you want to find out more, I'm happy to hear from anybody. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan, that's great. Um, and uh, we've got one more speaker and then we'll look at the results of the um, polls and uh, have the Q&A. So our next speaker is Alan Wild. Um, he is the Housing Development and Enabling Manager of Oxford City Council. Uh, and he comes from an interesting background, being a Housing Development Manager. He worked with local housing associations. Um, he's been a house builder. He's been involved in low carbon building. Uh, so uh, we're looking forward to hearing from him. So, Alan, over to you. Thank you. Oh, um, sorry, can I, get, can I just interrupt? Can we have um, questions that uh, are after Alan, we will have the Q&A. So if there are any questions, could people um, uh, start putting them on the chat? Thank you. Sorry, Alan. No, no problem. Um, my role at Oxford City Council is the head of the development team there, building on behalf of both the council and its wholly owned housing company, Oxford City Housing Limited. Um, and this presentation I've been asked to give is around the challenges we've found. Uh, sorry? Oh, sorry, in the actual construction. So who are we? Oxford City Housing Limited, we're a wholly owned subsidiary of Oxford City Council. We were set up in 2016 to deliver additional housing for the people of Oxford while supporting the council through dividend payments. Uh, there's a particular focus on affordable housing, but that needs to be balanced with the requirement to deliver financial returns to the parent or authority. The business plan we've currently adopted calls for over 2,000 homes being provided over the next 10 years although that is concertinaed into the first five or six years to an extent, and it is likely we'll be looking to deliver in excess of 2,000 over that period of time. We have already started on 13 sites around Oxford and just outside of Oxford, delivering 146 homes. The photo at the bottom of the slide uh, is the one that's most advanced for 43 units in an area called Rose Hill. Um, we're delivering a mix of uh, affordable housing in terms of shared ownership and social rent. Uh, social rent is uh, the preferred affordable rented tenure in Oxford, and that provides a significant amount of financial challenge. And we're also delivering homes for sale. Uh, Pre-contract, we're with 36 apartments in the city centre on a difficult site built on top of the Blackfriars Friary from medieval times, which is causing us a number of headaches. And we're in pre-app or have been in pre-app for over 900 homes on other sites around the city and outside the city. And we are, uh, we've acquired land directly from the market and we're in negotiation to acquire 
further sites outside of Oxford at this moment in time. COVID has challenged local authority finances greatly. Um, we've been asked as the housing company to accelerate delivery and increase returns to help with this challenge. At the same time Oxford has a housing crisis, we are consistently ranked the most unaffordable city in the country and we need to maximise the provision of affordable housing wherever possible. Oxford has declared a climate emergency like many authorities. We've also been the first authority to carry out a citizens assembly on how we address the climate emergency. And the council has recently passed a motion calling for all council uh, development to be delivered to zero carbon by 2030. Uh, and a significant proportion of that to be in place by 2025. Um, the housing company as a wholly owned company, the council needs to deliver on this carbon redu reduction agenda. We have many challenges. There was a high volume of work, but a limited number of local contractors, some of whom avoid Oxford. Skill shortages. We have an older workforce. We have the challenges that Brexit may bring. We have competition from large infrastructure projects. We have high construction costs, especially on constrained contaminated brownfield sites. The, the picture being shown is that of the archaeology that we're having to deal with at the city centre site at this moment in time. All of this obviously has a contribution towards the costs we face. And because of this, we have a lot of cost in the ground. The cost certainty is often achieved quite late in the process. This also has an impact on the speed of delivery as we spend a lot of time in pre-contract. We have a lot of um, debates, should we say, discussions with our contractors over how to actually address the challenges, how to deal with the contamination in the ground, how to deal with the archaeology. And all of this means that delivery is not quick. We need to look at the quality of our built product as um, the skill shortages uh, are exacerbated by the factors I've already outlined. We're finding that, uh, should we say, traditional wet builds can be variable, and we're having to increase our clerk of works and our quality assurance work and spend more time on site, effectively um, asking contractors to try again, simply because they haven't got the skills they used to have to deliver the work as it's been specified. And on top of that, obviously, we have the challenge of delivering the zero carbon agenda. We've discussed how to address these challenges, and we believe that off-site manufacturing can certainly help us to a great extent overcome many of them. The speed of delivery, there's a 20 to 50 percent reduction to build programs um, by using off-site manufacture. Costs, we have the potential to achieve savings for ourselves and occupants. We can hopefully achieve certainty early in the process. Uh, in the process, all indications are that this is possible. Uh, we've been talking to a lot of people who have delivered off site manufacturing volume elsewhere, and it is often uh, mentioned as one of the chief benefits that they are able to identify their costs earlier as a result of knowing what their superstructure elements are in their cost plan. The quality, as we pointed out, uh, there's a reduced snagging. There's been evidence from off-site manufacture. Uh, typically, that's achieved through a, obviously a factory environment that's much more controlled than trying to build uh, often in a muddy field. Productivity, we have seen reductions of up to 80% in site labour. Uh, that also obviously applies to uh, traffic on site and traffic around development sites and with the efficiencies and the planned construction within a factory environment that can pan out to a 25 percent increase in productivity overall now at sustainability um, we can achieve an up, up to 90 percent reduction in waste during construction and uh, that is going to help us greatly in meeting the zero carbon agenda especially when we move on to how we deal with um, carbon that's embodied in the actual construction process and we hope that although we have should we say more hope about the covid crisis diminishing in this country through vaccinations it is going to be easier to manage covid in a controlled factory environment than on site 
So at the moment, OCHL is currently looking at sites ranging from five units to 392 units. The most of them initially are on council land, but we are starting to purchase land in the surrounding county. Um, challenges are not limited, uh, but include archaeology, ground conditions, contamination, cramped sites, plenty of conservation and heritage issues, a, a very well informed and organised local opposition in a city that is globally renowned for um, the quality of its historic built environment. And that is always going to be a challenge for anybody building in Oxford. Uh, Oxford has also um, been very clear about its desire for less cars in the city. Um, and that's reflected in the new local plan. But that does uh, clearly present a significant challenge uh, for developers in terms of viability. The design and external elevational appearance of this process, of the results of this process, are going to be critical to the success. And what are we hoping is that um, all of these challenges which lead to more time being taken up in the pre-construction phase, if we can save time in the construction, that's going to be uh, a major benefit. So the journey to zero carbon. New factory built homes typically cost 20% less to heat than traditional built new homes and half the cost of the average existing UK home. Um, Off-site manufacture can help us achieve a reduced energy use on site, reduce storage on building sites requirements because obviously there's less material requirements on site and there's uh, less space required for staff welfare as there will be less construction staff on site. There's reduced waste, reduced traffic, and a whole house system can allow us to have a, a coordinated approach to how we achieve zero carbon. And the housing company, OCHL, and Oxford City Council are committed to leading in this area. The framework we're looking to establish is uh, looking to deliver these objectives um, over the next four years, and we split it into two lots. The first lot is focusing on SME and local providers, and will have scheme costs up to eight million pounds, which in Oxford is going to be somewhere between 30 to 40 homes. And then lot two will be focusing on total scheme costs over eight million pounds, and will be very much focusing on larger uh, organisations. We're focused on delivery agents. We want a single contractual relationship for delivery, i.e. contractors. And then we expect contractors to be establishing their own arrangements with delivery partners, i.e. factory providers. And they need to be demonstrably in place for the purposes of the framework bid. But uh, later on, whilst they're on the framework, they can choose to work with other providers as long as they can satisfy us that they're meet, meeting our expectations and our specifications. So carbon is critical. Um, and as we and the government develop our thinking in this area of work, we have incorporated three different levels of performance within the framework tender. We're looking at CO2 emissions, which are 40% below the future home standard, which future proofs us within the local plan. Then we are also looking at a passive house equivalent standard and then also a net zero carbon for regulated and unregulated energy. And the plans at the bottom are uh, one of the seven standard dwelling types we are going to be seeking prices for from the market in this tender process. The process is we've launched already our PQQs to uh, achieve a shortlist. Uh, and then we'll be going out to that shortlist with the detailed tender in early April and looking for a response by the end of May. We'll have a very intense period uh, over June and part of July where we look to interview and visit uh, factories and completed developments elsewhere and looking to make a decision uh, in July uh, in order for, to allow us to move immediately into our first procurement, which is an 80 home site that we're currently preparing the planning application for, and we hope to have uh, planning permission by July, August of this year. 
The framework will have a maximum price plus inflation mechanism for each dwelling type. So we've got seven dwelling types and we're just looking at the superstructure elements because clearly each site will differ in terms of uh, what the substructure works are and what the bespoke elements are. And so we'll be going open book on that. We'll be looking for an early two stage mini competition. At the moment, the objective is that that will be at Reba stage three, but we're going to try and bring that into Reba stage two. And before that, uh, before we actually enter into the, uh, the full build contract, we'll be working under a, a, a pre-contract services agreement to uh, arrive at a guaranteed maximum price for each contract. And the intention is to have standard dwelling types. As I said, we're working up seven at the moment that are capable of meeting our sustainability targets. But what's key to the framework is that we enable innovation from framework partners. So framework partners, when they bid, can say, yes, we can meet your standard dwelling types. This is the price for that work. However, we would propose that you deliver it in this fashion instead and give us an alternative price and an alternative specification. It's going to be impossible in 2021 to have in our standard house types to have anticipated all the technological advancements and design advancements that will be happening over the next few years. So it's absolutely critical we keep the framework as flexible as possible. Um, how it will operate is we'll have an umbrella agreement for the framework overall, and then we'll have mini competitions and apply JCT contracts for each individual site. And finally, we have many risks to consider. We have uh, fire resistance to look at, obviously, at the forefront of every uh, contractor's and every developer's mind at this moment in time, especially on high density homes. Uh, access is critical, especially if we're bringing in volumetric units. Uh, being able to get the, the, the lorries in is going to be critical to how a site can come forward. And indeed, although this framework is intended to deliver the bulk of our development program going forward, we, are, we do recognise there are going to be sites that are going to have to be delivered in the traditional way, where either the site is too constrained for access or just too constrained to be able to use our standard case types on it. Uh, ownership of the homes under construction off site is an insurance risk that we need to deal with. Overheating um, is at the forefront of our mind uh, as we go uh, for more and more airtight dwellings with MBHR, we have to address overheating in a sustainable way. Um, I have to satisfy my maintenance colleagues in property uh, about the durability of homes going forward. And it's sometimes it can be a difficult sell that when we're knocking down systems built homes from the 1950s, factory built homes, uh, to then be making the case for factory built homes in the 2020s. Now, there's uh, quality assurance is gonna be key as we go forward and we are procuring a specialist energy quality assurance company to make sure that we are able to deliver the improvements and close the gap, in fact, erase the gap between the designs of the homes in terms of how they're meant to perform uh, with regard to energy and how they are actually constructed and how they actually do perform. I think many of us will have been, uh, should we say, scarred by experiences where we've been promised a lot from the design uh, but the, the builder has simply been incapable of delivering some of the detailing, some of the technical aspects. And um, sometimes Clark of Works, who come from a very traditional background, don't have that level of uh, experience with new technologies and new approaches to be able to pick up on where there's problems. So we're going to close that gap from day one by uh, having a specialist quality assurance role. And finally, we have to make sure that the homes have market appeal. The housing company's business plan is very much focused on being able to deliver market homes in order to cross subsidise the social rented homes that we have to provide. And to do that, we have to maximise value. We have to make sure that they are mortgageable. And that, I think, is where I'll stop. Thank you, Stefan. That was really great and uh, very appropriate. I uh, just want to see if I can um, uh, share the results of the poll. Maura, can you do that? Are you there?
No, never mind. Okay, uh, so we've got uh, some questions. Does anybody have a question that they'd like to ask? If they um, would like to put something on the um, chat or just signal that they'd like to ask. Alan, I, uh, Alan, John, I've opened the poll results now, so you can review the poll results and kick that off now. Uh, thanks. Now, where, where are they gone? They'll just be under polls. Polls. Okay, got it. Okay. Do I, I share the results? Yeah. Or well, just discuss, yeah. Okay. yeah just discuss. So it's it's interesting that um, we've got um, about 54% uh, of most of you don't know uh, whether your local authority is aware of uh, 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 whether it's being uh, applied to a, a pilot authority to do the national design code. So uh, that's a bit sad, but uh, there you go. Uh, do you think the principles of the 15 minute city should apply to your neighborhood? The answer is yes. The interesting thing about that is, is um, so how do we make that happen? Um, do we have to change our policies? Do we have to um, uh, designate uh, particular areas to be inclusive of those policies or, or what? How do we move it ahead? Because there are an awful lot of players with an awful lot of uh, ideas and uh, uh, fingers in the pie. And uh, have you adopted or are considering using Building for Healthy Life? I'm glad that uh, uh, some of you are actually using it. And uh, if we look at uh, 17, uh, 70, 76 percent, so just over three quarters of you, uh, uh, don't know um, uh, uh, or are, are not adopting it. So there's, there is a long way to go within the institutional framework of local authorities um, to uh, process some of this. And that's, I guess, something for local authorities and the leadership of local authorities, which Claire pointed to, um, uh, uh, that's something that, that needs perhaps a little bit more thought. So I'm gonna stop sharing that and um, Let's see who we got here. We've got any two questions for David Rudlin. Okay, David, uh, how do you see the local authorities being able to produce their design codes, considering the vast majority don't have any, any, any urban designers or architects? To that, I think it might be useful to find out whether actually local authority um, should, should tear up most of their design guides because we've got a national one now um, which presumably covers a little bit more about the process uh, than they did. Um, so that's the first question. Second one is site-wide design codes are often submitted alongside design and access statements as accompanying documents. And often it's very difficult to determine what contents go in which document. Um, usually those are produced by, if I may say so, I'm adding a little bit here, uh, usually they are produced by the developers themselves, so they don't care one way or the other. Um, a lot of content suggested in the National Design Guide are provided in design and access statements, but they don't have uh, a uh, legal status. So does the design guide and the design codes have legal status? Okay, uh, the, the, the one about capacity is obviously a crucial one and one which is always asked and um, I'm only too aware that local authorities have been denuded of, of capacity and resources um, in, well, for, for many years actually. Um, I think that there's, there's two answers to that. The, the first is that the Office for Place, I, I, I presented a, a Create Streets thing yesterday with Nicholas Boy Smith and the Office for Place, which is the new body that's been set up to support um, uh, placemaking um, and particularly skills and capacity, um, that's part of the job that they've been created to solve. Um, so whether they do it or not is another matter, of course, but of course that, that, is, what, that is what they're hoping to do. I wouldn't really tear up all your existing policies because I suspect they all say um, something um, which is broadly correct. Um, I think one of the things that as someone, I, you know, I've written design codes for local authorities. I've also done them for developers on sites. W what we do, 
rather tend to do is reinvent the wheel every time we do one as if it's the first time this has ever been done. Um, hopefully the process set out in the National Urban Design Code, which of course isn't a code, it's a guide to creating codes rather than the code itself, um, is it relatively, it, it helps you to shortcut the process. You don't need to invent the wheel. It, it, it gives you the wheel um, to work with so that hopefully you can um, do it relatively effectively. I mean, we, we, we almost toyed with the idea of creating a website where you could go in and literally fill in the, fill in the, um, the, the key parameters and the code would automatically be, be generated. I think um, there are ways of doing this effectively, but I, I realized that it will require resources. The, the main thing, of course, will be the consultation side of things. Um, when we looked at the time involved, it's the consultation with the community, which is really time, time demanding. Um, so in terms of the, what was the second question, John? Sorry, I've forgotten. Uh, the, the second question is um, uh, uh, site-wide design codes are often submitted alongside design and access statements. So it's this business of um, uh, a separate code. There, there are separate codes for each application that comes in. Uh, and uh, sometimes that's quite confusing. Sometimes it's not very relevant because it's a repetition of something that's been done before the vocabulary is very familiar. Um, so the question might be here, uh, you know, how, how, you know, it's very difficult to determine what's for real and what isn't. Um, and a lot of the content suggested in the national design guides are provided within a design and access statement. So first of all, you know, that's why one of the reasons why, you know, how much of this can we get rid of? Um, uh, and how, yeah, and what is the status, the legal status, for instance, of, of the model design guide? In other words, if a local authority says, um, I'm going to create a uh, design policy, which is that we will follow the model design codes, and therefore um, we want a stripped down design and access statement, or something that's very specific to that particular area, rather than the um, sort of usual stuff we get. Um, uh, that would be a way forward. So how do we get all this working together so that it's just not another layer of advice? Stuff, yeah. I mean, I must admit, you know, we as a practice produce DNA statements for master plans. We produce design codes as part of them. I'm sure many of us on the call do. And I get really annoyed when... Um, I, I, I recognize that a developer is saying, well, could you not just make that illustrative? Um, and, and what they mean is, well, we'll get it, use it to get through the outline planning stage and, um, and um, we can then ignore it going forward. I, th I think there is a lot of that goes on. Um, the, the best a scheme ever is, it, is that as it's submitted for outline planning and then afterwards it becomes something which then gets dumbed down. Um, so the, there's a purest answer to this which to say if you've got a really good local design code and it's based upon a master plan for each site, then the requirements for DNA statements and actual local design codes become a lot less because the design code which exists will, 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 will carry that the weight. Um, the, the, the course, that's the purest answer. The, the actual reality is that every site is at a different stage of development and many will have master plans already done for them. So you're not sort of coming in clean to the process. And I think the idea is that the developers master plans would be incorporated into the code where that's the case, where there's an established master plan or an outline planning consent, then the master plan that developers created will be ported into the code and used as the basis for, the, for that coding so that you then incorporate the work that's been done in the work going forward. Um, in terms of legal weight, the legal weight is that of a supplementary planning document um, under the existing system. Um, that's the weight that it will be given, so it becomes a material consideration which can be used in determination of a planning application, but no, no greater than that at the moment. Um, we aren't talking about the future planning system today, but there is potential to give it much more weight in a future planning system. Okay, thank you. And uh, a key question for any local authority um, is, is what's wrong with new developments uh, and what can we fix with an imperfect, imperfect pieces uh, that we start with? In other, you know, so we, we know what we don't like um, uh, and, and what doesn't work. Stefan has talked about it um, in Building for Life and also Building for Healthy Life. He's said that this, that these are red areas and these are green areas. Uh, so, um, if we know what's wrong, Stefan, how do we um, 
make sure that uh, somehow we don't repeat the same things over and over again. Is this an issue for procurement? Is this an issue for design? What, what, what's, what can we do? Or is this a, 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 an issue for policy? What, what can we do? Uh, well, that, that, that question in the chat bar actually sort of came from me. Um, oh. more, 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 more as a prop. So it sounds as though I've planted a question to deliver a completely off the cuff, perfect response. But it was, okay. I, I simply put that in as, as um, a, 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 a sort of uh, picking up on some of the discussion that was happening with David and, I, I, and, the, and the question from Morella. So my, my point there was, um, I mean, I was sensing that um, you know, that, that, that there's been a period of sort of government retreat from um, design regulation for, since since the credit crisis. You know, and and you know, um, you know, David and I and and uh, you know John uh, and a lot of other people here have, have seen that. Matthew Carmona talks about it in his book. You know, you get the ebbs and flows of of government regulation and interest in design. And I, I do think one of the risks um, and, and maybe sort of the underlying uh, sort of question for Morella was, was the fact that actually, I suppose, as, as, as a local authority, it can almost be almost like that, that, that there's, there's a lot coming at you. And it's, it's you know, what, what do you respond to? What do you do? I mean, I, I think sometimes too much regulation is, is equally as bad sometimes as too little because uh, you can actually end up confusing yourself. So if you're sat there as a local planning authority and you're thinking, right, I've got the National Model of Design Code, I've got the National Planning Practice Guide, it's the MPPF, all this, it can get, you can get overwhelmed with it and you can almost tie your soul up in knots. And and I suppose I was just purely suggesting that, I've, as I see it, you, you've got the main policy base, which is the MPPF and the National Design Guide. And then, and then you've got the government basically saying, right, we've got the National Model Design Code, you can fall back on that, but as David said, it's 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 a guide to creating your own. But that's what government have said in the absence of local guides. You can fall back on the national model design code. Secondly, you use the national model design code to create your own local code or series of codes. Um, but at the same time, the M the government says in the MPPF and and in the national model design code that there are other um, tools out there. Now, build, building for life is one of them. I think it, it really comes down to what what suits your particular local council in terms of the conditions. I mean, you, you could hypothetically, you know, commission your own code, um, but then I think you've got to be really careful in your commissioning to make sure that you, your, your consultant team doesn't go away and then three months time they give you a code and you don't understand how to use it. So I think if councils are using, say they're going to develop their own codes, because that's what they've identified as the best. I would say that make sure that in any commissioning, you, you're involved in almost how, what form the code's going to take um, um, and, and get them to train you as part of that fee as well, rather than, you know, your design code pops through the door or pops into your inbox and you as a council sit there and go, I don't understand how to apply this. Um, and I think that's where the supplementary um, part of the National Model Design Code is useful because it, it, it starts to show you how you code and, and, and how you regulate. Um, so it comes down to a point I was making in my presentation, which is policy is one thing, but you, you've got to have people on the ground to be able to interpret and apply that confidently. So that I think that's very much an, a local decision as to what works best for them. And it's a decision that's got to be with cabinet members, planning committees, planning teams, policy, but picking up on some of the stuff that's coming in the poll, um, it seems as though maybe more conversations need to be happening within some local authorities as to what various parts of the organisation are doing. Yeah. Okay, uh, we've got a question here from Steve Weitzel. Weitzel? Um, could you unmute yourself and, and ask the question? This is for Alan. Uh, I think. Uh, yep, Steve Weitzel here. Thanks for pronouncing right. my name correctly. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was just saying to, uh, um, I was listening to Alan's talking and the, and the benefits of um, uh, off-site manufacture or modern methods of construction, I think we used to call them, and the savings in times and costs. I just wonder whether any research has been undertaken into the benefits arising on the health and safety front, um, especially due now, uh, seeing as most of the 
uh, work would be in more of a factory setting rather than on site? Yes, it's a good question. Um, I haven't seen any research, but um, I know that the health and safety executive uh, support the benefits of off-site manufacture for the very reason uh, you've set out. You're working in a, a factory controlled environment. There's much less on-site work at height as well, because there's less requirement, sometimes no requirement for scaffolding, because everything's done on site. Also, all electrics and plumbing work is done in a factory. And so all of these activities are done in a repetitive controlled fashion, rather than being done on site with labor that uh, you may not have worked with previously through a subcontractor. So I think uh, you would expect there to be health and safety benefits from uh, off-site manufacture. I've just not seen any research projects that have shown, you know, X percentage reduction in accidents. Okay. Uh, thank you, Adam. Okay, there's a question about um, uh, greenfield sites. So maybe Claire will will answer that. Claire, do you want to un, un, uh, pr um, unmute yourself? Do you want to unmute yourself? Yes. Uh, so there's a question about greenfield sites, and uh, in this southeast area, there is a huge pressure, and many of the sites have. Um, have already been um, uh, not allocated, but been taken up and, and are being promoted by developers. Um, uh, and in the new developments, how do we get those um, criteria from the uh, 15 minute city to um, be embedded in you know, places like um, uh, dare I say, Vista or, or Didcot or whatever. Yeah. In other words, we don't just become, or we don't just have dormitories. I mean, actually, it's probably a good idea um, to talk to both Claire and to David on this. Absolutely. Sh shall, I, shall I kick off? Um, yes. I think it's a really um, interesting point. And obviously in 20 minutes um, on the 15 minute city, you can't, <laughs> can't get into everything. So it's a very high level overview. Um, it is a conundrum and I think that what happens too often on greenfield sites is you get a large site um, and from a local authority perspective when there's real pressure for housing delivery it's easiest to develop this one massive great site um, or, or, or handful of great sites and it puts a lot of power into um, the developers' hands. Um, and so a lot of um, making this happen, I think, lies with developers. Um, I think local authorities find it very difficult to mandate really high quality local centres, um, which really embed the qualities which will be needed uh, when we're talking about the 15 minute city. Um, certainly in the five, six years that I was in local authority, um, a, kind of a few years ago, I remember sitting in front of developers and, and then very openly saying, well, we'll keep the local centre on plans, we're going to market it. When that marketing fails, well, we're going to develop it for housing, that's going to be great. Um, and so there's almost a, a tried and tested um, process that certain developers go through, um, which is a bit negative, but optimistically, there's um, a very um, different model, which I think more developers are adopting. And certainly in Savills, we've done um, significant research into the values that you get from placemaking and the values that you get from, um, we haven't rounded it the 15 minute city, um, but, creating a neighbourhood which has desirability and has longevity. Now, this doesn't necessarily translate particularly well when you're building 50 units, but if you are building 2,000 or 7,000 units and you are therefore going to be on site for 10, possibly even 20 years, the values that you can achieve over that time are a really important part of your equation. And people will see what is, people buy into a neighborhood. When people are buying a house, they're looking very aspirationally in terms of the kind of lifestyle they are trying to achieve. And if that's a, a five bedroom detached house with um, 
a huge great triple garage well that's going to lead them to another type one kind of development but a lot of people I think especially now uh, want to live in neighborhoods where they feel connected where they have access to goods and services where they can see um, their life kind of panning out over a series of years rather than the house being a commodity only. Um, and what um, research has done into you know, places like um, Dorchester um, in Oxfordshire, what's being done at um, Upper Hayford, the former airfield, is investment in um, local centres and facilities kind of upfront. So getting all that placemaking kind of invested in upfront. Now, it potentially is a bit of a lost leader in terms of the balance sheet for those first few years. But what they're finding is when you get to year seven, you're actually getting massive value um, increases. So I think it's very hard in terms of planning policy, uh, but I think there is certainly a, a way of educating developers that this isn't actually, you know, that their, their, their kind of current mode of um, just rolling out um, house after house after house, after house in a monotonous way isn't actually optimizing their values. Um, and I think that's probably the, the best way that we can, we can angle this. But welcome views from others. David. Well, you'll recall, John, that when we did the Wolfson Prize, we said that you can't build a settlement from scratch. Yes. It doesn't work. <laughs> um, and actually, the first answer to the question is don't allocate sites in unsustainable locations. Um, you know, allocate sites in places which do, can get access to existing facilities. If you do have to allocate sites in unsustainable locations, then as Claire said, you have to invest up front. I mean, developers um, understand this. I mean, they're not stupid and actually they actually understand the long term value, but they aren't going to build shops if shops aren't going to have shopkeepers who can make a living out of that shop um, for a number of years. They aren't going to build schools which are going to be empty because the population hasn't yet arrived. So I think it is, there's only so much you can do having chosen an unsustainable location through codes or whatever that is you do to create a sustainable development. So I think, um, yeah, ideally you, 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 you look at our Wolfson principles, for example, to actually create settlements in areas which can be sustainably developed. Do you, do you think that um, uh, one, of, one of the things that uh, Professor Moreno said was, was that um, uh, we, we need to think, rethink the way that we do our re real estate. We re really need to um, uh, think again, because at the moment we've got 40 to 50 percent of land uh, um, uh, is given over to the car and to parking and is hard surfaced. And the question might be if we rethought the typologies um, because we're working from home or we want to work near from home or we need these things uh, um, to uh, reduce the amount of use of cars, then um, we, we end up with a different um, uh, sort of uh, layout, for, for instance. I mean, I, was, I, I for instance, was, was quite interested in the the uh, drawings that you had of the suburbs, because they don't differentiate anything very much from what's been going on. Do you think that we need to move ahead a little bit and move on from there, that model? Well, yes, of course we do. Um, it, it, it's a case of finding the opportunity to do so. I mean, we have a site at the moment in Cambridge, which is a big site, 5,000 homes, and we're looking to have no parking at all for yeah. Um, and to keep parking to the periphery of the area. So the last five minutes, you'll have to walk to, to your house from, from where you park. And it's amazing what that does for the urban design. All of a sudden, all those constraints that we've been used to for years about roads and parking and so on, suddenly fade away and you can actually do urban design in a very different way. So yeah, absolutely. Um, and but I do think that the, the more fundamental problem, which I think um, Stefan alluded to, was that we have this, this development system based upon house builders rather than yes. developers. Um, and actually, if we if we had developers and our clients in, in Cambridge is you and I, which is actually a good example of a developer rather than just a house builder. They're just as interested in the shops and the, and the commercial space as they are in the housing. Um, and I think we do need new developers like that. And there are about some about who can build places rather than just housing estates. 
Uh, Alan, is there, is there something that you might, might like to add uh, on that, um, say, about uh, things that are happening in and around uh, Oxford, which are um, a, a significant numbers of uh, people uh, are being housed there? Um, well, Oxford's been very clear that it needs to tackle its air quality issues in the city. And it also obviously has a desire uh, to deal with a uh, very clear ambition to deal with um, reduced carbon emissions. So um, cars are being uh, increasingly um, excluded from new development in the city. There's a clause that requires uh, car-free schemes to be close to public transport, to be close to shopping, um, but uh, there is a clear policy that in areas where there is a, a controlled parking zone, new development will be expected to be car free. Um, but there is a factor, though, with my developer stroke house builder hat on that causes problems of its own. Um, there are there's never an intervention that is purely positive. There are also issues that creates um, not least uh we have to try and address what happens to people who need cars. So for instance, we're having a discussion at the moment about care workers and how uh, a care worker who needs to travel around the city supporting older people and disabled people in their homes, are they going to be excluded from some of these new developments simply because they won't be able to have their vehicle parked? And, and we're trying to address that issue. There's also an issue around family housing. And there is an expectation in the market that family housing will come with a parking space. So these are issues that we are trying to work through. But I absolutely accept that, you know, if you remove the parking from some of these areas, the, the opportunities for a completely different approach to the urban design is, is absolutely apparent. And you can produce areas and neighbourhoods that are significantly different, should we say, from, from what has gone before. And it's balancing the commerciality of that issue with the aspirations um, to have a much improved local environment that we're battling with at the moment. OK, um, and um, uh, I've got um, Vaughan Anderson here. Do, Vaughan, do you want to uh, ask your question about um, uh, developers taking a long term view? Hello? Do you want to unmute yourself? Good. I think the, I am unmuted. I don't know, are you hearing me? Yeah. Yeah. So it was really a question thinking about um, the, the question about whether shops get built in at day one, which obviously, Is going to be a challenge if there is there a way where developers can uh, look at how the growth development or where we have local centers how they are built to enable them to evolve and adapt um, over time as traditional uh, areas in, in most towns and cities have done for years and have a, a more engaged um, opportunity in terms of bringing uh, the local community to cu to curate and co-manage those spaces in the interim until you know there is sufficient population uh, and there is sufficient footfall to make a, a probably a more commercial entity um, you know is that something that's been considered in in the design code about how how we create that type of flexibility within buildings. Okay, Stefan, do you want to go with that? Um, yes, I mean, I, I was quite interested in Vaughan's comment and, and offered um, uh, a, a response in the chat bar. I, I think it, it, it comes down to developers and what motivates developers. And we know you get different types of developers. You know, even the the volume large house builders in this country have got different approaches to design quality without naming names. I think 
if if we if we had a um, um, a series of post-its and we put all the names of the big name house builders and had on one side a spectrum that said um, more geared to design quality, less geared to design quality. Um, I, I think we'll be able to recognize that some developers are more design minded and, and they choose to do that for a number of reasons, some of them. Some of them choose to do it for corporate social responsibility reasons. Some of them just decide to do it. As part of, uh, some of them decide to do it for, you know, almost like ethical reasons, you know, that they don't want to generate profit at any expense. They want to leave something behind. But in the absence of, of that almost being regulated for, um, I, I suppose the question is, is if you're a developer and um, you, you haven't got that um, almost like that so social minded um, sort of moral compass um to, to to put in quite a diplomatic way and, and the planning system doesn't effectively regulate against that so you can get planning consents you can build um what you get consent for and the consumer um partly because of the issues with housing supply willingly buys that at a price that generates a substantial profit and, and look at you know one of the biggest names in house building and look at the profits they generate you sort of think right well that that that's maybe an underlying problem um so i think some of these issues go deep i mean I, I completely agree with david as soon as you you know um uh don't have to accommodate the cars the design opportunity is just it's just enormous i mean oh. it's i mean it ticks every box density sustainability everything um, and, and I think this is this is a trouble that if if we just densify mm. without the right public transport infrastructure in place, all we do is revive PPG three, which we know was an absolute disaster. And because I mean the PPG three was was almost a London centric policy. It assumed that if if you densify and if you reduce parking, people will migrate to public transport. But most of my career was in in northwest Leicestershire. We we didn't have a, well, still don't have a, a single train line, even though it was one of the birthplace of the railways, they were cutting the beaching cuts. So you've got huge amounts of housing growth um, without any public transport infrastructure. The, the sustainable urban extension, I, think that, I don't think we call them that anymore, but the SUs as we used to call them, the, the, the SUE to South East Colville, 5,000 homes, um, straddles the old um, Leicester to Burton line. So the council, um, about what, 20 years ago, thought this is a cracking place, we'll get the station opened. People get on the train, you can be in Leicester in 10 minutes. And without boring you with all the ins and outs, um, um, that there was no government or regional funding to support it. So the council's local planning authority actually did everything right. And we had the opportunity to create everything the other speakers have talked about. But without that infrastructure and with a bus every other Tuesday, you know, if you've got good wind in your sails, you don't obviously get the frequency of public transport that people can rely on. I mean, it's not just getting a bus every hour, is it? Because if you're anything like me, you're always leaving the house late when you need to get the bus. So um, I, I frequently miss the bus, but the reason why I use a bus is because normally there's one in another 15 minutes. And thinking back to some of my university days on public transport, they say that you know, there's a direct correlation between frequency of public transport and people's, um, the, people's desire to have a, or need to have a car and car ownership levels. So if you've got the transport infrastructure in place, I think people then start to make cost benefit analysis going, well, I've got a 30 grand, 20 grand car sat there on my driveway, not doing anything. What, what's the point? Um, wow. And so, so, so I think these are the deeper issues, really, that... that yeah, there's a whole ecology of decision-making going on, which has got uh, implications. OK, so on that, I think uh, it's now 2.30, and uh, uh, we should uh, wind this up. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, David. And thank you, Stefan. Uh, brilliant. And uh, if uh, everybody could just... Uh, either clap or show some appreciation in some way or another um, in terms of reactions, that would be great. Hooray, we've got some. <laughs>
Okay, thank you very much, everybody. And um, uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs> but also the next time we've got a, a session on the white paper on the 11th of March, which will be very good. And on April the 28th, there's a session which will be including Tim Stoner and uh, uh, of Space Syntax, but also Andy Von Bradsky that uh, David mentioned, who is responsible um, to the, uh, for the Ministry of uh, Communities, Local Government and Housing. Uh, again, he will discuss the National Design Guide and the model codes and the sort of design pol planning policies. So we look forward to seeing you guys and to everybody else uh, in the next couple of months. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Yeah, thank you. Speakers, do you want to stay? I think most uh, of them, Alan's still here and Claire. I think we've lost Stefan and David. Uh, yeah. Never mind. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I was about to leave, but I heard, heard you. <laughs> okay. In the last um, seconds. <laughs> indeed, that, indeed. That's okay. Don't, don't worry about it. I think we're, uh, there's nothing more to say, really. But um, did you feel that went okay? Yeah, I think that was a, that was a useful yeah, thing. I, I, I've enjoyed it. Alan? Yeah, that was fine for me. Okay. That's good, Alan. Not, I don't know whether it was what you were after, but yeah, it went fine. No, I, I thought your stuff was really interesting, Alan. I think it's um, it, it there's a lot of questions. I mean, there's probably a lot that we could discuss for that, but I thought it was um, really interesting how you it brings kind of yeah you know, the topic of this talk was originally going to be build, 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 um, and actually how you build fast um, and how you build at density um, in places like Oxford is a massive challenge. So I thought everything that you had to say was was great. I think that's true because if you look at um, if you look at some of the stuff that's going on around, uh, it leaves a lot to be desired um, because it's still the same old pattern. Um, one's intrigued about Barton because I think you know that's that's moving in the right direction. Mm. Um, but you're as you know as everybody's been saying, it also requires decent connections uh, to to make these places work. Indeed. I think uh, the, the challenge I'm facing it, it is literally trying to make sure we can get uh, we can get market interest in homes that aren't going to have any parking. And that's a real unknown at this moment in time. Mm. I think Oxford is an unusual market, though. Um... And I, I almost halfway through the talk, Maura, I almost sent you a note saying, could we set up another poll going? who would be willing to give up their car if we did um, kind of manage to achieve a, a, a um, 15 minute city in your neighborhood? Because um, I arguably live in the 15 minute city. We still have a car as a family. We're, we've, we've debated whether we do give that up, um, a new zip car, um, or share one with a, a family on the street. Um, but we we still have it, and you know I'm fairly sustainably minded, yeah. um, and talk about 15 minute cities and etc. But it, it's convenient if I want to go down to Devon or to Bristol, it is very convenient still. Yeah. Um, and so I haven't we haven't given up our car. We only have one as a family, which is less than average, but we still have a car. Well, I think there's a lot to be said for um, you know some super highways for uh, cyclists and pedestrians because yeah. to make that much more yeah. attractive than it is at the moment uh, that'll get some people off uh, I, I know from my my uh, son who lives in where do we call it uh, uh, south london uh, i mean it's impossible they gave up the car and they use the car only uh, when they need to and mm -hmm. if you look at the last year we've all spent money on our cars by by just Keeping them uh, sitting in the in the in the in the driveway mm. because you know we've had to pay insurance, we had to pay this, and had to pay that, and so on and so forth. Well, I, I anyway. guess I guess the interesting thing is projecting forward ten years when you know we have a lot less people, uh, young people aren't taking their driving tests, 
Yeah. Uh, we have automation, which is likely to come to the fore. Um, and we have a, a model of use, which is very much about a combination of sharing use slash uh, not owning anything. So leasing So already. I'm not sure what John would know what um, my John would know what the percentages are, but you know, a huge majority of people are leasing their cars. Well, what happens if that gets to a very, very short term lease? So you're leasing for the day, you're leasing for a journey. Um, it's the Uber model. I, I, I remember this um, uh, conversation.